Hello and welcome to the Mind Your Career webinar series. My name is Rachel burkhan Rommelfanger, and I work with the Alumni Career Development Team here at the University of Chicago in Hyde Park. I'm delighted to welcome you to our webinar entitled Less Leadership Lessons from the C-Suite. Today's speaker is Kimberly Togman, who is an MBA from 94. She's a career coach, a word nerd, and a flywheel junkie. The best present her husband ever gave her was on her 50th birthday late last year. He presented her with a cake in the form of a Scrabble board, complete with word racks and a scoreboard, and her in the lead. Kimberly is also a proud member of the G7, a group of seven women, all you Chicago friends, who get together annually and text almost daily. It is my pleasure to hand the controls over to your fellow alum, Kimberly. Great. Hi there, thank you so much, Rachel. I'm thrilled to be here today. And um, I'm, so thank you very much, and thank you very much for joining me. Yeah, I work with a lot of clients who are in a variety of roles um, in organizations. Most of the organizations that I work with, or most of the C-suite leaders that I work with are in smaller organizations those that range from having under 50 people to in the under 500 range. So the, what I'll be speaking about are lessons learned from speaking with, with clients and friends uh, over the years, but they apply equally to larger organizations. At this point, you know a little bit about me, so I'd really love to learn a little bit about you, and, I've, and I have two short poll questions just to get an idea of who's in the audience. So Rachel, if you'd go with the first poll, please. So the poll's been launched. What role do you hold at work? And there are five answers that you're a C-suite executive, a manager of managers, a manager, maybe you're an individual co contributor or self-employed, or maybe you're in transition. We'll keep the poll open a little bit longer because folks are still answering. Okay, we've got all our answers and you can see our results, attendees, that we have 17% are C-suite executives, another 17% are managers of managers, 33% are a manager, 17% are either an individual contributor or self-employed, and 17% are in transition. Spectacular. So now uh, we have a, people from a range of, of different levels and organizations, um, so that's great to know. And then just to also get an idea of the size of the organizations that you all work with, could we have the second poll, please? So the poll is now live. In terms of employees, how big is the organization you work at? Over 500, 100 to 499, 25 to 50, 10 to 25, or fewer than 10? Keep it up a little longer because I see folks are still answering. All right, we'll close that poll. And you all should see the results on your screen that 68% of you work at organizations with over 500 people, 12% of you work at places between 100 and 500 people, 4% work at a place with 25 to 50 people, 4% at a place with 10 to 25 people, and 12% at an organization with fewer than 10 employees. Spectacular, well thanks so much. And again, as I, I see that most of you uh, are from larger organizations, um, the things that we're talking about today absolutely are applicable anywhere. So when I was thinking about exactly the, the things that would be most useful for us to talk about today, uh, I ended up grouping things, grouping the lessons into three different categories. So there could have been many. The um, first one, which is I think the foundational leadership competency is really around self-awareness and self-awareness being broken into knowing yourself and knowing what you want, knowing who you are, uh, what's important to you, and also knowing about your skills, strengths and weaknesses, and your basically your, your personality preferences, how you react in different situations. And starting with knowing what you want, starting with knowing what you want, 
we find that, oh, crumbs. Sorry, I'm having a little technical difficulty in forwarding the slides. My mouse isn't working. Sorry, there we go. My apologies for the technical difficulty. So I, I start with this slide with Martez Moore, who is, a, as you can see, the chairman and CEO of Moore Frere Company, a private equity firm in New York that works in acquiring businesses in the technology, telecommunications, and uh, and media spaces. You know, some people start out knowing, on the knowing who you are, knowing exactly what they want. And clearly, Martez, from the time he was in uh, kindergarten, knew the path that he was on and where he wanted to go. But that's not the case for, for most people. Most of the, uh, in fact, it's the case for very few people. Most of the leaders that uh, both I've spoken with and that I, that I have worked with figure out somewhere, somewhere along the way. And even in the case of someone like Martez, in his career, he started out knowing he wanted to do deals, but not knowing exactly um, how deals were accomplished. So first he thought, I'm going to be a corporate lawyer because corporate lawyers, they're intimately involved in the deals. And I think they get the deals done. And quickly he learned that that's not actually the case, that he really wanted to be in the position where he was driving deals. In order to drive deals, that ended up putting him on the investment side. And when he was on the investment side, he learned he learned that in order to structure the deals, sorry, not to structure the deals, that he that he quickly learned over about six or seven years, he became an expert in corporate finance and he could structure the deals. But when he looked at his skill set and knew what he was what he could do, he realized that actually it was going to require more. That he needed to have strategy and operational experience if his ultimate goal that he was driving towards was going to be to to have his own organization managing capital. And so for his path, he then jumped to doing strategy consulting with McKinsey and found that that when he acquired the strategy skills that set him up closer to his goal. But then the next piece for him was getting operational experience. And getting operational experience, he hopped over to working for Viacom, where he ended up running one of their divisions, um, one of their di digital divisions before looking at his skill set and realizing that in fact he had everything that he needed now to start an organization and run an organization. And in 2014, um, late 2014, he ended, hop, he ended up starting Morfair. So in the knowing, so again, I said self-awareness. Self-awareness, um, I'm thinking of in the ways that, that, that I mentioned before, it's about knowing yourself and also it's about being yourself. Yeah. Knowing yourself in, includes being able to take a close look at yourself, an honest and close look at yourself and knowing what exactly are my strengths and weaknesses? Kim Redding, the uh, former CEO of Brookfield Investment Management, a global investment management firm, talks about, talks about his realization that he was great at the idea generation and at coming up with where, where to go. And he said that he'd, he'd work with his right-hand man and he would say, listen, I'm great at coming up with ideas. I come up with, let's say, 12 ideas every day. And what I know is that one of these ideas is horrible. Ten of these ideas, well, they're okay. And one of these ideas is brilliant. And I need to work with someone who can sift through these ideas, sift through and help me figure out which of the things that are actionable, what are the things that we can do next. So he positioned himself in a way that he could do what he was great at and that people that worked for him could take up the other the other roles. Building on your strengths is really the best way to, to be an effective, uh, an effective person in the working world, um, as well as an, an effective leader. Because once you are able to identify your strengths, you know, think about it, if you, if you improve something that you're already really good at by 10%, 
that can make a really great impact. So if you improve something that you're not so great at, you know, that might bring you from, let's say, a D level to a C level, but the impact on the business is not going to be great. And the impact on you and your skill set is also is also not going to be as fantastic as you'd like. So build on your strengths, absolutely critically important. Building on your, um, make sure that you also look at the things that you're not so great at and make sure that, that those are get to, get to the point where they're not a liability. Much of my work as a coach is really in helping people slow down the action and be able to understand who they are, how they act in, in different situations. And in understanding who they are and how they, how they, how they interact, they're able to accomplish more. Um, another, another person that I worked with, Nicole Weaver, who is the uh, chief information officer and the vice president of strategic initiatives at the Kennedy Center, talks about how earlier in her career, she started out in software development and she realized that she really was quite unhappy looking at this, working on something very small. She really wanted to get to a point where she had a view of the big picture. And so she took her, from, from there, she went and worked with um, AOL. And with AOL, she found that she was at a point when she was managing 120 project managers and, and she found, oh, that's just too abstract. I really need to work in some place where I can both have an eye on the, um, on the concrete details as well as be, ha focus on look at looking toward the big picture. And knowing yourself too, it's really looking at fit and realizing, realizing what are the things that you bring to the table and how you interact with other people. In reacting, to, you know, Nicole found that that you know she is someone who is a driver, drives towards getting things done. She's very very strong at rolling up her sleeves and being able to uh, to go wherever she's needed. And in some places, she'd get feedback that she was scary. Uh, and found she spent a lot of time trying to fit into boxes and figuring out how to interact better with with other people. And actually, she, and she is a lovely, warm human being. Uh, she realized that. Look, if I'm scary, um, I need to find a place where I'm able to go and get things done and that people respect my skills, my talents, my abilities, and, and can, get, can get those things done. So, second arena for uh, leadership lessons. It's really about building great teams. And to build, to build great teams, there's really three different components. The first component is in hiring. The second component is in developing your people. And the third component is in keeping people. What we find is that fit and culture um, and hiring uh, end up being the most critical pieces of a successful, a successful business. And the biggest mistakes and failures that people have are in the arenas of, of hiring failures. Cindy Towers, the CEO of Jura Solutions, a Philadelphia-based uh, legal services and staff augmentation and recruiting firm tells me tells a story of hiring a sales manager early on that they were so excited to get because this person came from a large organization a gl large global organization and they were so so excited to get him and so scared that that he wouldn't want to be there they they spent time focusing on the wrong things they offered him um, they he had a credible reason for for wanting to come to to a smaller company where he'd only earned two thirds of a salary, um, but they 
really found in the negotiation process and throughout that they that they didn't do their job. They didn't do their their due diligence in looking at what are the things that that we need and the skills and the abilities that someone needs in our organization to be able to to get things done. Often people who come from large organizations going to smaller organizations, the cultural change the cultural change is really dramatic. People don't have the resources that they that they had in the large organization and they really need to be able to roll up their sleeves and and focus in and get things done. And this man wasn't able to do that. In fact, he was so not able to do that that he he, he nearly helped he nearly bankrupted their company. He created a fictitious pipeline and before they had fired a number of their managers, sales managers, before they figured it out. And in talking with um, with Cindy about about what they missed in this situation, they really missed looking at the big picture. They really look, missed looking past the the um, shiny thing of the ex expertise that they thought this person had and thinking about, well, is this person really going to be able to operate in our environment? They focused on, wow, we're so lucky to get this person. We're small. Instead of focusing on, instead of thinking of, what is this person bringing to our organization? What are the things that we need to be able to, that he needs to, to offer us? I've heard from, from others, uh, a president that I know uh, in an earlier stage company was, was said to executives that he was bringing on board, hey, look, you know, I'm hiring you for these things that are on the first page of your resume. But truth be told, you know, for the next number of you know, years, you're gonna be doing, this, doing a lot that's on the second page of the resume. So culture fit is really, really, um, and skill fit is really, really important. Going back to um, to competencies, you know, and differences, you know, people are different. Being able to to operate um, and know how to motivate each of your employees um, to help them achieve their goals, which is also about achieving your goals, uh, is the way to be the most effective. You know, Often we think, well, gosh, you know, what is my reason to get to know these people? Not my reason. I shouldn't be delving into these people's personal lives. I should, I should, I should stand back. And what you need, to, what you can do is really realize that if you if you learn about people and you start thinking about how people operate, what are the things that are important to them? What are the things that you can do to help make their working environment and their life um, easier helping them achieve their goals, then both you and they have an opportunity to be to be successful. You know, if one person, um, you get the use everything you can and have clues to manage people to their to be the most success. This also means. We could do the next poll, please. The poll is oh, no, live. Get that. That's the wrong. That's the not that one. The next one, please. How much time do you spend coaching your low performers? More than 80% of your time, 50 to 79% of your time, 25 to 49% of the time, or less than 20%. We'll leave it open. I see that there are still some more people answering. Okay. You, can, you should all be able to see the results. How much of your spine do you... Time do you spend coaching your low performers? Zero percent spend eighty percent of their time or greater. Ten percent between fifty and seventy nine percent of their time. Thirty three percent of you said twenty five to forty nine percent of your time. 
And the majority of you, 57%, said you're spending less than 20% of your time coaching low performers. Great. I think we have the next poll, please, too. All right, similar category. How much of your time do you spend coaching your high performers? 80% or greater, 50 to 79%, 25 to 50%, or less than 20% of your time? We'll leave the poll open for another second because I see more of you are still answering. Okay, you can see our results that 8% of you spend 80% or more of your time, 15% spend 15 to 79% of your time coaching high performers, 42% spend 25 to 50% of your time coaching high performers, and 35% spend less than 20% of your time coaching high performers. Great. So, so it seems from, as you can see from these poll results, that you know, a lot of you spend um, a lot of time, uh, sort of an equal amount of time coaching people who are your highest performers and your lowest performers. Um, one of the things that um, uh, Samir Wagle, who was the former CEO of Protein Bar, said that early on in his career, when he was working for McDonald's Corporation, he worked with a, a leadership coach at that time through a program who came in and, and talked to him about his employees and asked him what he was, how he spent his time. And when they looked at where he, where he allocated his time, it turned out that he spent somewhere between, um, he spent most of his time working with, his, with two of his lowest performers and less of his time with his high performers. And then the coach asked him, what would happen if you, if you took all the time that you spent with your low performers and instead spent them working with the high performers? And that's exactly what he did. And when Samir focused on helping his high performers get what they needed, he found that his results uh, accelerated greatly. And not only that, but in watching his, in working with the high performers, he started to get the reputation as someone who was able to, to help develop high performers. He set very clear expectations. He uh, set, and aligned, made sure that his, the incentives were aligned to get what he wanted. He would tell his people, look, there are lots of things that I want you to think about to be able to do your work. Um, but I'm going, but I'm going to try to take, I'm going to take the mystery out of, of how you're going to be um, evaluated, how you're going to be giving, what the incentives are that you're going to get. And he really looked at all, all of the structures to make sure that they were aligned, both the, everything from the bonus structure to the performance review, um, and even in hiring, what the criteria were for uh, hiring in different positions. And that is able to, to enable them to be most most effective. This third piece is about communicating and communicating mindfully. Just a little bit of a um, of a uh, this is a little bit of a head fake here because um, communicating is such a broad category. Um, and everything that um, you do, it's really about getting buy-in, getting alignment, letting people know where they stand, know with whom you should share your information, and teaching the people below you how to communicate with you and making sure that from the people above you that you know how you should be communicating upwards to give people what they need. And part of that is knowing when to share information. When Nicole Weaver was at Women for Women International, she was in charge of um, their technology and their sponsorship 
sponsorship program, um, which was a huge source of funding for the organization. At one point, they were doing a data migration um, and a change to their sponsorships, um, where where they were changing the way that the the, the price structures were working. What happened when they when they were working through it and they pulled the switch? Um, they found out that it was well, it was 95% good. There was there was a bug that was there was a bug in there that they couldn't convert immediately. And in the time that they couldn't convert it, couldn't convert it, they lost a significant amount of money over time. And, and that that money over time amounted to about a loss of a you know, million dollars in sponsorship a year. The good news was that they uh, they it was against a two thousand dollar increase, um, but still knowing finding out that they could have had twice. Um, twice that was, was incredibly problematic. Nicole learned two things from this experience. One is that she was probably a little bit complacent in, in thinking about how, the, how they could fix a, a bug like that. The second part is that she hadn't well prepared her boss for, a, for the possible malfunction. She hadn't considered it being particularly likely or, to, or, or that she wouldn't be able to fix it quickly. And when she realized also that, look, um, later in her career, she realized, look, if I'm making a decision that's going to impact someone downstream um, or a decision that's going to have I swivel towards, <laughs> towards somebody who is responsible um, for this organization, then they really should know the risks associated with anything that I'm going to do. And I need to make sure that the decisions are shared. So in this, the idea of being super transparent and laying out communications, giving people the option to control whatever piece of it they can. Great leaders, great leaders end up communicating in such a way that the information is digestible, that they are able and it's actionable, and it gives people the the options to the options to handle the situation. So in a situation like this. Yeah. The right decision was probably to go ahead. However, one of the, the right decision was to go ahead, though she should have let someone else make the call. She should have brought, brought people along so that the head of the organization, the president of that organization, could have taken part in the decision-making process. Also, as I um, referred to earlier, communicating specifics about what you expect of people really allows them to win. It allows people to both know what it is that they need to do to, to do a good job. Because people, want to, because people really want to be effective. They want to do a good job. So if you are in a place where you're telling people, look, this is how you're going to um, achieve the goals, then they've got their instructions, they can go for it and, and be successful. Also letting people know where, you, where they stand, letting them know where they, they stand also makes them know, limits the surprises so that you're not having tough conversations out of this, that are surprising or out of the blue. Also letting people know where they stand and being transparent is about helping your people know how to present information to you. It's mentoring the people who work for you on, on how to manage up to you so that they provide you and present you with the information that you need to be effective and that you can then go and do little with to then present it up and provide the organization with what it's looking for. Because if people know clearly that they have, let's say, three things to report on or three things that you want to see, they start to, they, they start to beat themselves up if they're not going to have that information, and they know exactly what to do to provide you with the goals. Another thing is you can never over-communicate getting buy-in for projects that you're working on, 
for every um, Tis Dehan, who is the head of marketing for Dansko, the comfort footwear company, learned the hard way that building relationships included included communicating and getting people to, to buy into her projects. She had an experience where it was the day before a sales meeting and she was launching a really huge project um, for, for a German company that she was working for, that she was working for a seventeen billion dollar company, and that CEO um, called the CEO of the division she worked for, which was a one point five billion dollar division, and said, "No, that launch can't go." It was an hour before launch, and said, "Well, you can't do that." And when she said why, she was told that the people in Germany would be embarrassed about this project, embarrassed. She said, well, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's a win for everybody. And what she was told there was that, no, because these people didn't know about it, because it was done independently and without them, they didn't trust the information. They, they, were going to be, they would be in, embarrassed. So the big learning for her there was that if she had brought them along, if she had early on in, in the project, if she had presented to them and helped them see the project and see that it was a good idea and to see that that um, and to have them take some ownership of the project and not cut them and make sure that they are part of the process, she would have been able to to accomplish her goals in a much more effective manner. The third part of communicating and being mindful communication and being transparent. It's about listening. And listening from the perspective of slowing down the action to see what's coming, the information that's coming out from another person. It's about being able to hear the words that come through and to not be considering while someone else is talking, what exactly am I going to say next? Not just it's, it's not waiting for your turn to say something. It's really about knowing that, look, this person is providing me with information that once I have it, I'll know what to say next. They're telling me for a reason. And the way to listen effectively is to paraphrase, to let people know that you've, you've heard them, to show that you've heard them by, um, asking good questions, repeating back to them some of the things that they've said, and then helping to take the conversation to the next level. I'd like to, so in those three general areas, the three areas for the lessons, leadership lessons. One, again, is be yourself and know yourself. The component about knowing yourself also is about bringing your authentic self to work. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people earlier in their careers think that they have a way that they, that they must be. Instead of thinking of a way that they must be, it's about taking your own talents, taking your own skills, and ways of being and putting them to the most effective use. Building great teams is about surrounding yourself with people, giving them the skills and the tools that they need to achieve. And finally, communicate, communicate, communicate. Make sure that you are being transparent, sharing the information that you need, as well as listening fully. Um, I'd like to, that's the end of my formal presentation. I would like to um, thank the number of people that I spoke with in coming up with the lessons that we spoke about today. Um, and I'll um, give it back to you, Rachel. Great. The first question I have here is you shared with us these three great lessons and a, and a little bit of stories, but could you share a story about how 
uh, folks have been successful enacting these lessons in their workplace? Could you share another example? Another example of enacting these lessons in their workplace. Um, okay, um, I'm just trying to think of, of one specifically. Um, Sure. So um, in thinking about a, um, a goal and knowing a goal and reaching an objective, sorry, um, st structuring incentives in a way that people could achieve, achieve them. Um, uh, Samir Wagle told me a story about when he was in India, he was managing um, from McDonald's India, and a competitor came in and decided to pay their hourly employees to, to raise to, to raise what they were paying their hourly employees. And the thing, the issue here is that the um, company was on their, was, I believe it was Pizza Hut, you know, they were a delivery business, and so they could afford to pay people a higher hourly rate um, because there were far fewer people. So in thinking about the goal that they wanted to achieve, um, Samir worked, worked on thinking about, well, how do I end up keeping my people, making sure that I get to keep the good people and only have people leave who um, I don't mind if I leave. And so what he ended up doing was looking at the incentive structure and creating an incentive structure where the most high performing stores received, the, the managers of those stores received it, Quite a bit higher compensation um, for reaching their goals. They, I believe, they they get like 150% of their compensation for reaching their goals. And what happened there was that the people who were able to achieve the goals, the super top performers, were like, "I'm staying here. I'm going to earn a lot more money from being here and meeting my goals than I am if I go across the street to to Pizza Hut and um, and I can have a slightly higher hourly rate, um, but it will not help me meet these goals." That's one example. I think another um, example is um, sorry, I'm 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 thinking. Um, I, I think another an, an, another um, thing that I think is super important is in being able to understand for yourself, the things that drive you and the environment um, in which you're going to be successful. Uh, a lot of that comes to things like risk profile, um, knowing that knowing that if if you're someone who is um, has a if you're someone who really values safety and stability and knowing that you're going to have a paycheck um, that, that comes with home every two weeks, every month, um, find a situation in which you are better able to, to manage that. Um, people who are the um, people who are entrepreneurial, when I spoke with them, risk didn't really come into play. People would ask them, hey, are you someone, you know, you took all this risk, does that make you quite, quite courageous? How did you manage, um, how did you manage your fear over that? And I think to a person, they said, look, for me, the risk was not in making the move. The risk was, the risk was if I stayed where I was, I'd be unhappy. I wonder if, so talking about knowing yourself, are there resources or skills um, that people might look to to help them know themselves better? You've just mentioned like thinking about your risk assessment is there anything else? Sure. There's tons of things that you can that you can that you can do, and there are tons of tools that are that are out there. One of the things is um, you can do assessments. There are there are um, things like the Myers Briggs Type Indicator will help you understand yourself from the perspective of some of the personality preferences that you have, um, and it also is really helpful in helping you understand other people. Um, also, the Enneagram is another uh, is another 
tool that's out there which helps you understand that there are there are nine different uh, types. It gives it helps you understand how you are and both what the strengths of the and the virtues are of the personality type that you that you have um, and what the challenges are. Um, there are also uh, any time that you can have a 360 degree assessment where somebody where either a survey based one where you have people that work with you and for you provide feedback on um, d different arenas uh, and then you, you can then see get a snapshot in time of here's where you here's the here's where you are very very strong and here are the areas in which you are not so strong and that you might want to develop. I think any time you have the opportunity to take on a stretch project to work in a in a, to work with people that are outside of your own department or organization, it helps you build skills that you'd like to, that you are um, looking to develop. So it's about taking on taking on different assignments. And there are loads of books that are that are really um, terrific too. Daniel Goleman has a number of books on emotional intelligence um, that help you understand uh, help you understand more about uh, the four different components of emotional intelligence, which are uh, based on awareness and management, self awareness and self management, as well as social awareness and social management, relationship management. Uh, Marcus Buckingham has a number of books that I know that um, at least some of the leaders that I've worked with have found very helpful. Uh, one being First Break All the Rules. Nicole Weaver talks about that as being seminal for her. Also talks about Now Discover Your Strengths. Um, a book that I, something that I find to be incredibly, incredibly helpful for leaders right now is something the 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership, which helps you realize, uh, which gives, gives leaders ways to be both approaching themselves by understanding where they are, um, if they're in a position that is, that they are in, that they are creating what they want to create, or if they're more in a place where they are at effect, at the effect of things that are happening happening in and around their environment. And it goes much further than that. Um, one question is, I have someone I work with who is a low performer and I find myself spending more time with them than with high performers. What tips do you have to help me make the adjustment to spend an equal amount of time with my higher performing staff when I keep feeling the pull to support the lower performing staff? Well, in working to um, with your lower performers, and I, and I think another something that um, that I found people struggle with um, all the time is you know, one um, one of the people that I've worked with calls it like knowing when to get rid of the weeds. Um, so it's identifying. Look, are you going to be able to bring this person, these people that are that are the lower performers, up from being D players to, to A players, you know, probably not. Um, so it's really a matter of being really super transparent with them, um, having the tough conversations and saying, look, you know, you're, th these are the areas in which you're not meeting your goals. And um, here's the support that I can offer you. Here are the things that we can do to help you achieve those goals. But look, if you're not up to the task, then let's figure out a way for you to find a place that's going to be a better fit for you. That's great. Um, another question about sort of communication, what resources or skills can folks use to learn how to communicate in the ways sort of you describe of really listening deeply to people? For listening specifically, um, I'd say there are a number of different components to uh, to listening and communication. And one thing that you, you know, it's being spoken about a lot um, in the world today and in business is the importance of reflection and mindfulness. Um, but creating a practice where you really slow down to be present, um, to be able to be in the moment and to, to, to experience what's going on, that that's, um, has 
such benefits, not only in um, giving you the ability to hear better, um, but also um, in being able to help you in reducing your stress, your stress levels and managing better. For um, listening, uh, other listening tools, um, or listening tools specifically, um, there is a spe spectacular article that McKinsey put out a couple of years ago, which is called The Executive's Guide for Listening. And um, it, it talks um, about this idea of not waiting for your turn to talk, but really listening and hearing what the other person needs to say, uh, is, is, is wanting to say, because really, you know, our minds work so much faster than our um, than than our mouths do, or um, take, we can take information in so much more quickly than we can than people can get it out there with words. Um, it's really about figuring out how to you know, be present, listen to every word, and then um, and then and then interact or then then act. When you're working with these C-suite executives and you've coached folks, how do you help them to know when they oh, you cut off, I think? Um, when you're working with these C-suite leaders, how do you help them to know when they've succeeded in meeting these goals or being successful in their work? Well, whenever um, you're working, when I'm working with, with anybody, first thing we do is we set some goals. Um, and and in working to make them as specific and measurable as possible. Um, it can be in terms of a um, particular business goal they want to achieve. It can be in terms of um, feedback that they, they want to, that they'd like to be receiving. So uh, they can be looking at the delta between where they started and where they get to. Um, uh, but often it's through, it's often it's through really the feedback um, that they continue to receive from other people. It's them knowing that, that, that they've achieved different results. Um, in the, um, a lot of the emerging leaders that I've worked with who are in a place where they are taking on larger roles and they need to, they've been elevated to a role where they are um, needing to be able to, you know, face more towards the business, be able to, uh, spend less time stuck in the weeds and, re and rely more on folks that they work with to get the job done. Um, they often find that you know their people are happier. They're getting they're getting their people are doing more and taking on taking on more. And the performance of the uh, of the you know the vision of the organization uh, is being elevated. So what advice might you give to someone who is an emerging leader of where they should start with these three items or something else? Um, I would start, um, well, first of all, I'd take a look at your most recent performance review um, and have a conversation on, on what are the things that are, would be most impactful for them um, to get to the next place. Um, so that's, that's, that's one place. And I think, again, the taking the really um, hard look at themselves um, and saying, you know, what are the things that, that I am finding that I'm great at? You know, am I spending my time doing those things that, um, that you know, I'm in a state of flow or that I feel really, really strong doing? If not, you know, how do I restructure my time? So would you add time management? The question is, would you add time management to your list? You have these three things, but you just mentioned restructuring your time, that perhaps one way to succeed is managing your time well. I, I, sure. I mean, managing your time is absolutely something that's, that's important. I, I think that um, it is um, uh, typically the managing one's time is more of a um, symptom of, of a larger pro of something else. So if I have very clear if I have very clear goals, if I have um, if I am if I have a mandate that I know that I'm working towards, um, that I have worked with 
you know, CEO, the president, whomever that's in my reporting structure so that I know what I need to achieve. Then it's sitting down and saying, well, am I working on this? Is the thing that I'm working on today? Yeah. How is that serving me in reaching the goal that I'd like to, that I need to reach? And if it's not saying, okay, well, so if, if this is not helping me reach that goal, why am I doing it? You know, is this serving the business? Is this, um, you know, who is it? Is this serving me? What, what is the goal that this particular activity is reaching toward? And if it's not reaching toward the, the, the right thing, it's saying, okay, well, how do I get rid of this? Is this something that, that can be not done? Is it something that is that I can be giving to my to someone who's in my um, chain of command to complete for me, um, or is it um, something that that um, I think I may have already said this that should just c c can be left behind um, or put on the back burner until a future date? What tips or suggestions do you have to help? Um, executives hire for fit for their organization? How might they communicate clearly with applicants the, the culture of the company? Well, I, I think having a, a, um, a hiring process and first of all, it's being able to know what your culture, you know, what your culture is, um, being able to define um, for yourself things, you know, like, you know, what the company values, you know, and it's, it's making sure that all of the structures that you have in place um, lead toward the same lead toward the same goal. So you know, know what behaviors that you are motivating, um, because because if you're not getting what you want, it might be a, a case that you are um, looking for the wrong uh, that you are motivating the wrong behavior. So that's that's one piece um, in hiring hiring for for fit. Um, the best way for hiring is, uh, in general, is how can you have someone show you that they have the skills that you need for the job? How can you replicate um, an experience in the hiring process, in the interviewing process, that will give you information on this person's ability to do the job? Uh, because things like interviewing, we're all crummy interviewers. Uh, the data is uh, ridiculously bad on on uh, people who think they're great interviewers and they're they're really not. Um, there's been some research I don't recall from where um, where you know, people would have been better served to have have just um, fact checked a resume and um, and the accomplishments rather than having interviewed people. So there's that that component. Um, the other another piece is in you know, really getting to, to know somebody um, in the interviewing process, um, being really clear on, uh, on what your high performers, what the things are that, that um, they have and do that make them successful. So it's knowing, you know, it's knowing the difference between um, what the you know, head of sales at your organization Need, um, needs to do to be successful or does to be successful than someone who's the head of sales at another organization. You know, what are the, what are the deltas um, in, in how they conduct themselves, who they are, um, and what's important to them in life? There are, other, there are also, depending on, the, um, depending on your resources and how you, and how you want to do, um, do your hiring, there's also the ability to use some screening tools that will help you. I know the Hogan assessment provides you with information that, that can be used in hiring. Uh, Hogan provides you with three different uh, scales, one of which is um, about, about potential. The other is what are the things that are likely to be derailers for this particular person? And the third is on, on values. What are the things that are likely to be most important to this person? Great. Well, we're at 12.55. So, Kimberly, I would just ask you if you have any closing, any extra closing comments for us about um, these interviews that you did and the insight you gained from coaching C-suite executives. Well, I, um, you know, uh, I think I said most of it in there. I, I think that the, um, the truth is that, um, that if you have a goal of being a uh, 
you know, being an executive who runs a, an organization or a component of an organization, the thing that is going to help you get there is the you know, knowing who you are, knowing how to surround yourself with people that bring out both the, the best in you and um, provide you with, supplement your, your skills um, and, um, and then you can be unstoppable. Thank you again, Kimberly, so much for sharing these tips with us and these practical lessons that you gleaned from your interviews with folks you've worked with over the years. And thank you to everybody else for joining us and listening in today. We are going to have more programming in June, but if you're in the Chicago area, we invite you to come out next weekend to Alumni Weekend, May 30th to June 3rd. Um, we will be hosting a live careers panel meeting with entrepreneurs here in the Chicago area. Um, if you want to join us again for a webinar, we'll be starting those back up again in June. On June 14th, we'll have Being a Badass, How to Own Your Power in Business. Hope to see you again. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thanks, Rachel. <laughs>